Hello, Manchester, and welcome to Ward 13. I have a very special guest today, Jason. And this is going to be a variation of a man on the street interview because I literally went out on the street and found Jason amongst talking to the Veterans for Peace. Yep. That uh, uh, I think they stand <laughs> witness from, I think, noon to one. Uh, at the corner. They call it the Brady Sullivan Plaza. When I was a kid, it's the New Hampshire. It was the New Hampshire building. It was the tallest building, the 20-story. Is is the is it green glass? I'm colorblind or brown. Uh, it's more of a brown. Okay. That's why I couldn't become a Marine. I remember I went to Decatur, Georgia. My father was living in Atlanta, and I scored the highest ever on the ASVAB. And I wanted to be a Marine. They were all excited. And I wanted to be a Marine. And it was this big. You ever see a Navy chief of the old? Maybe they're they're they've slimmed down, but they used to be like you know, massive oh, yeah, I've seen muscles, them. big what they call a Navy chest. So he's flipping the color book to see if you have color vision. He went through three, and he's grunting. You know, he says, "We don't have to go on," and just slams it. <laughs> so that was the end of my career as a Marine. But <laughs> later, uh, <laughs> because you need perfect color vision to be in combat arms, because you have to see the different camouflages who you're going yeah, to Yeah, I'd imagine, yeah. So I wound up in military intelligence and uh, <clears throat> because uh, you didn't need perfect color vision. But tell us about yourself, Jason. Uh, I live in Manchester. I've lived in Manchester my whole life. I'm uh, about to turn 27. I'm a uh, U.S. Air Force veteran. I did uh, about two years in the Air Force. And uh, I, just, uh, I was just walking home and... Uh, saw the Veterans for Peace with their signs, and uh, I'm a veteran and I'm for peace, so I stopped and talked to them for a few minutes, and uh, here I am. <laughs> here you are on TV. And what do you, what do you think of the wars uh, going on? Were you, did you actually serve time in a combat zone? No, I, I was never in a combat zone, I never deployed. Oh, okay. I was, thankfully, I was always in country, I was always here. Now, when my brother was in the Air Force, he did 24 years from 70s to about 2000, the early 2000, right after the turn of the century. Air Force people were actually considered non-combatants. So during the Persian Gulf War, he, he, the Air Force was the only people, they rotated him just before the war. Everybody thought it was gonna be a very bad conflict, and he was grateful. But then John Sununu, the old, first John Sununu, who had been the governor of New Hampshire, I think before you were born, and uh, I don't know how old you are, but... 1988. Okay, before you were born. In fact, in 1988, that's when George H.W. Bush got elected, and John Sununu, I can't remember if he's John E. Sununu or that's his son, he became the chief of staff for uh, George Bush. He just wrote a book about him, uh, about uh, President Bush. And uh, he was the one that got, he had two brilliant ideas, but one of them was to negotiate with the Revolutionary Guard, offer them money, plus they could repatriate to the United States and get Social Security and all sorts of benefits. So they just, this, the, one of the vanguard units just allowed us to go right through. And so this terrible, uh, what we were anticipating, a bloodbath, because I actually was called, I had just gotten out of the Army a year before, and said, get ready because we don't know, you might be mm. called up. But uh, that one only lasted, what was it, 10 days or something. It was very Wasn't short long. war, and it kind of gave us a false sense, I think, of security. When did you join the Air Force? 2008. 2008? So uh, that was Iraq and, Iran and Afghanistan. was. Yeah, there. Iraq and Afghanistan were both going on. Uh, Operation Enduring Freedom is uh, the Afghanistan codename. Operation Iraqi Freedom is the uh, Iraq War. Now, interestingly, I had friends in the military that I, I, I served from 85 to 89. So cold, I'm a Cold War veteran. And uh, interestingly, some of my, my friends that served into the 21st century, they'd already gotten to their 20 year mark. A lot of them objected to uh, the invasion of Iraq because Henry Kissinger, who had been Secretary of State under Richard Nixon, I remember what he said when Bush decided to invade. At the time, France, Canada was, you know, we have the, the, uh, the, secure, the Security Council, what is it, the five permanent members of the United Nations, mm -hmm. uh, Russia, China, France, 
the United States and Britain. Yeah. But can and there's the bigger. There's like 15 more that are just they rotate. Canada, uh, the Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, had offered to negotiate with France, and France wanted one more month to allow the inspectors to look for weapons of mass destruction. And Bush just turned that deal down. And with the English, Tony Blair, he went in. And I remember Kissinger, who ended the war in Vietnam and created detente with Russia between the US and the Soviet Union and China, said, I'll never forget, this violates 300, 350 years of international law from the Treaty of Westphalia. So I had friends that actually, when they could, Either they didn't resign their commissions because then you would lose your pension, but they they opposed the war and they as soon as they could they got out rather than to serve in that war. Mm -hmm. But when you joined in two thousand eight, what were your feelings? Uh, I mean, I I think that I was like most people in in the military who served. They they don't want to be at war. They don't they yes. don't. I mean, uh, soldiers and stuff they they they're trained for it, but most of them don't want to to have to go out and, and kill people or. or shoot at people or get shot at. It's not something that people want to do normally. I mean, um, uh, like you were talking about um, with Iraq, we, nobody, w nobody would deny that Saddam Hussein w was a, a, a brutal man, but he, he probably wasn't a threat to us. And the, it's, my, it's my understanding that the whole reason why we invaded them in the first place was because we were convinced that they had WMDs. Weapons and then, of mass destruction. Yeah, and then we come to find out they didn't have any weapons of mass destruction. I mean, they had gas and stuff that was bad, but they didn't have nukes or anything. Right. So the whole premise of, of our invasion of Iraq turned out to be pretty much false. Right, and that's with France. France, who was uh, said one more month, because uh, uh, Saddam was treating the inspectors very badly. One more month and then we'll join, which would have brought in Canada, which is a NATO member. Canada never joined the coalition, and neither did France. And uh, I, I, personally, I think Afghanistan was, is one thing, since the people that attacked uh, on 9-11 did come from Afghanistan. But one of the most interesting things about Iraq was they were going to end the sanctions. and. They had already, Saddam had already signed a contract where the Russians, uh, I can't remember what the Russian company, it's not Gazprom, I used to know, but Total Fina, which is, a, which is like a huge French oil company, after, and he was going to give the contracts to France and the Russians. And you can just imagine Bush, both Bushes being the oil men that they were. So there was quite a lot of cynicism about the uh, Iraqi invasion. And uh, but why did you join 2008? Did you patriotism? Uh, honestly, the number one thing for me at the time was career opportunity. I saw right. I saw the military as a very good career option, and um, also my father was a veteran. He was um, he served in both the Marine Corps and the Army and uh, fought in Vietnam. Oh. So he was he was a big influence. And my my grandfather was in the Army and fought in the Pacific in World War II. So I have a. a Patrilineal. Uh, oh yes, my father. Both my my father was World War Two, and my uh, grandfather was World War One. My father always had wanted to be a veteran, but he was an only son. So my grandfather, who had been in the army in World War One, and went through every battle on the Western Front, and he even got gassed. He said, "Nope, you can only be in the Navy." But uh, then in Japan, the Japanese with the kamikaze suddenly the the Navy. They were suffering a lot of casualties, but it's interesting when you have that background. Because my father, interestingly, in the 70s, he didn't want my brother and I to be in the Boy Scouts, the Cub Scouts. Oh, it's military. But he did expect everybody to do two, three, or four years in the military. So, But also, uh, the career opportunities. I think my brother, uh, the uh, Air Force turned out to be a great, great for him. He just thrived when he was in the Air Force. What, what was your MOS, your military occupation? I, I was uh, 1C131, which is an air traffic controller. Specifically, oh, okay. I was a terminal radar approach controller. I worked in the uh, radar room directing air traffic. And so what are your views? With it? What attracted you to uh, the gentlemen that are out there, the veterans for peace? Well, I mean, as I said, uh, 
I mean, when I was in the military, mo the majority of military members I knew, even even from the more uh, combat-oriented armed forces like the Marines and the Army, the majority of them even were were for peace, and especially veterans are for peace. So, right. Uh, the, in my eyes, that the military is something that that is for number one, first and foremost, for national security, for for the security of the nation. So I don't think that we should that we should be. Uh, uh, invading other countries for for profit or, or for for power, you know, it's it's should specifically be for our defense. I agree. That's why, like I said, that I I always saw a difference between Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, like I said, many people I they, they ended their careers rather than serve in uh, Iraq. Yeah, and uh, I we have this terrible um, history as a nation, especially recently of. of Creating these problems and then fighting them later, like uh, it, oh yes, and, and I guess they in, call it in, in the early '80s, I guess we we helped create the Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan. Yes, who we, we did. Who we ended up later fighting. Uh, um, we we helped fund Osama bin Laden and, and his his Saudi people who, who he was tied in with, and so we have this, this weird thing where, where we were one decade we're funding people and then the next decade we're fighting the same people we funded it almost makes you uh, cynical doesn't it because if you follow uh, recent history uh, Putin Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. who I call Tsar Putin <laughs> I was a Sovietologist uh, I was in a military intelligence unit that targeted the Soviet Union and Putin told Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, when they were arming these rebels that were going to go against uh, Sir the Syrian regime, that for as long as I know, uh, they've always been, the Soviet Union and Russia has always supported Syria, that the regime in Syria. I think it's Assad. Yeah, the Assad regime. Assad, yeah. right. But the father and the son. And he said, you know, just paraphrasing, are you nuts? Do you know who you're, you're, you're sending arms to? And that's who became, they call it ISIS or ISIL. And it's rather incredible. But see, when I talked to friends, you know, that were in the, the craft that we had, spy craft, whatever, I'm never technically a spy. Uh, we more, you know, we, we were uh, listened in. When we talk to people, it's it's pretty obvious to us. And you know, you learn how to read things. Mm -hmm. You're actually yeah. taught how to read things when you're doing military intelligence, and then you're you just naturally start reading. ISIS, ISIL, whatever they want, you want to call it, is actually, in my opinion, and many other people, it's the Revolutionary Guard, the younger, like what would have been the colonels rather than the generals, and then they take these fanatics use them as like a cover that's why they are so effective because these are military commanders that geez remember we supported Saddam when he went against Iran and they had that a war what would it last eight years from 80 to 88 where Saddam like it's the British supplied poison gas and he would gas the Iranians I mean when I was in the I, I hate to say it in the military we were quite cynical because of the we had, uh, what was the great uh, scandal back in the 80s? Uh, when we were funding, uh, they were sending money to the Middle East. Yeah, Iran-Contra. Yeah, Iran-Contra. You know, the same bank, the B Bank of Commerce, BCCI and all that. It's all like a shell game out of like a spy novel of the 60s or 70s. And, uh, you know, when you're in the military, you know, of course, we were just targeting the Soviet Union. But you're, you know, you're, we were watching the, the hearings and everything, and it's troubling when you realize, like the president and the the president that are actually involved in all this. I, I don't funny business, monkey business, whatever you want to call it, where they're actually now dealing with Iran to get money to give to the the Nicaraguans. It uh, eats a little away at, at your. Uh, patriotism I would think not patriotism itself but your not, idea of what your mission is especially in your government leaders I guess right. I mean, you, you get the feeling sometimes that these politicians and government leaders and stuff that, that they're 
they're playing war games with, with people's lives and, and doing things for, for profit and political gain, but in, in the process, they're, they're achieving those goals through, through blood. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'm up at the uh, Veterans Hospital. That's my main health care provider. And uh, I'll tell you, I have PTSD. When, we're in, when I'm in my... With, uh, when you listen to... It's hard to talk about, actually. To hear the stories from... We have people from 64 in Vietnam all up to the recent war. What it takes out of a soldier to be in combat, it's just... Uh, I don't even, I, I'm just speechless to what to say. There's actually a human toll. And now we have the, uh, one of the things I'm trying, I'm going to start fighting for is a drug court in Manchester or Hillsborough and a veterans court. So many veterans, uh, people don't understand about PST, PTSD, I think, that when you have it and it kicks in, you can actually, their chemicals get dumped into your body and you can actually feel like physical pain. So I can imagine how many uh, veterans actually turn to drugs as some way to assuage the pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know the heroin epidemic, I saw an overdose just last week. Somebody in the main reading room of the library. Yeah, it's terrible. It's just terrible. It, these, uh, there is a huge problem with both uh, addicted, mentally ill, and um, homeless veterans. It's, it's yes. three big problems that, that's tremendously affecting veterans. And if, if you go in and just and speak with random homeless people, probably at least two, two out of every 10 of them at least is a veteran, which yes. is way too much. There should be zero veterans. If, if, you've, if you've taken an oath to protect and defend this country with your life, then you should never have to live on the streets of this country. This country should always take care of you if, if you, if you if you took that oath. I agree with you. Last year I was trying to do a little outreach with homeless vets and it was, you know, I was just starting into it and that's when I realized the, there's a connection between homelessness, mental illness, which could be rooted in PTSD, their combat experiences, and drugs. And I have no way to, I, I have no idea how to deal with somebody, a veteran that's also on drugs. It was just, and then I just had to like disengage because it became, it was a whole new ball game rather than just trying to help somebody that's homeless, you know, put them in contact with people. Once you have the drug it, coming into it. It's hard to relate to people and to have, uh, to be very compassionate on people when you have no yeah. idea what they're going through. If you want me to be completely honest with you, I am a veteran who has uh, suffered and continues to struggle with and actually I'm been treating for certain mental health illnesses and addictions and I've been homeless. Yes. So I, I am intimately familiar with all three of those three of those things and uh, it, it's an awful thing and uh, treatment needs needs to be available for veterans. Are, are you getting the treatment you need? I am now. Uh, recently through the through the Medicaid expansion that that has helped right. a lot. I was able to get Medicaid and that helped a, a, a Tremendously, so I, I'm in full support of Medicaid expansion. And people, people, people should have health insurance. People should be able to get health care if they need it, especially veterans. I went up to when they were having the hearings on Medicaid expansion. I went up as a veteran and testified in front of the House of Representatives. And I won't mention the person's name or their political party, but uh, I can't believe the person. Uh, they, you know, they were on the panel and the guy smirks at me and I have a hot temper that I can't all if you ever watch my show you might see it come out and I I don't remember what I said to him but it shot him up but then then he still voted against a Medicaid expansion and uh, because it was so necessary particularly for women veterans and a lot of uh, women veterans that have suffered sexual abuse or anything, mm -hmm. or been harassment, a lot of them won't go to the veterans, uh, to the VA hospital. And our VA hospital here was really cut back uh, over uh, 10 years ago when the Republicans, George W. H., uh, George w. Bush, wanted to put veterans into for-profit HMOs. And it was the old World War II veterans, like my father and the Vietnam veterans, that fought back. But a lot of people had have lost faith with the VA, 
And so Medicaid expansion was so important. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was my duty to testify about that because a lot of people just don't know. They just don't understand. Right. And, you know, every person on earth is a human being who deserves dignity, especially in our country. We're, we're the richest, materially richest nation on earth. So we should take care of our own. I mean, we, these problems that we have could be solved if, if we cared about each other just a little bit more. We, we, we shouldn't be putting a, a price tag on helping people. Right. When it comes to helping people, getting people off the streets, feeding them, uh, taking care of veterans, taking care of elderly, especially elderly children veterans, especially those groups, if, you can't say, well, well, we got to spend, we got to spend too much money, so we can't do that. If if we are able to do it, we should do it. I agree. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, I'd like to, uh, well, I'd like to, you know, keep in contact with you, and perhaps you can come back on the show. Definitely, sometimes. Thank yeah. you very much for being a guest. Thank you for having me. We were going to have the, our initial New Hampshire Today show, Ward Thirteen presents. And we forgot to change the background. Oh, the, Back uh, to Ward 13. The Veterans for Peace wanted me to, to make sure that they got mentioned. I, okay. Uh, the, just Veterans for Peace is what they're called. Okay. So, uh, they're, Do they have a, a, uh, I think veterans a for URL peace .org. Uh, website? Veterans for, for Peace dot org or peaceinourtimes.org. Peaceinourtimes.org. Uh, viewers, go to the Ward 13 Facebook site and we'll post that information. Thank you, Jason, and thank you very much. We'll see you next week.